Welcome everybody to the continuation of the distributed file systems lecture. So we're again going to finish today what we started uh, yesterday. Uh, I will start with uh, the questions that were left unanswered and then we'll uh, go into uh, more details on the system, especially what happens if the main node fails, uh, what is the procedure for reading and writing uh, to and from a file. So this is what we look into today. Uh, before we start with the new questions, I wanted to follow up on uh, on somebody uh, who uh, suggested uh, that SSDs can be uh, optimized uh, in the sense that we can do better. And I would like to, to before I ask you also, yeah. So this is an example of, uh, of a paper. So you see people are looking into this. As you can see, this, uh, this paper describes how you can uh, do something hybrid between HDDs and SSDs. So you know the flash drive, the SSDs are faster uh, to access than the me mechanical drives. Uh, so people are actively researching this sort of thing. So if you are interested, this is optional. Uh, then for example, this paper is, uh, is something that you could uh, uh, look into. All right. So. Uh, let me reconnect to the slides and then we'll take any remaining questions either that are left over from yesterday or, uh, or uh, that you might have today and then I'll continue with the lecture. So Amir, do we have any questions? Um, not yet in the room. Not in the room and on Zoom, do you have any questions? Before we neither, continue? neither in the Zoom. Neither in the Zoom, all right. So what I do is that I'll continue also because some of the questions that I saw in the chat yesterday are actually going to be answered in the lecture today. So. This is why I just go ahead. Do not uh, hesitate. If you have a question, you can raise your hand in the room. If you're too shy, you can write it in Mattermost. If you're online, you can write it on Zoom or on Mattermost. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, make sure to answer them, right? Okay. So this is where we were, where we just over, right? So we have uh, the name node, the data nodes. Uh, there can be a thousand of them and the client that communicates with, uh, with the cluster. So we saw that the name node is responsible for if you have a metadata, adding a directory, asking to create a file, to read a file, and so on. There's heartbeats that get sent from the data node to the name node regularly, so it knows if they fail. The data itself is always sent directly to the data nodes and then pipelined over between data nodes in order to, uh, to make it even smoother and faster. So you see, we have the, the client protocol there, the data node protocol there. It's always the data node that initiates the connection to the name nodes, not the opposite. And here, the data transfer protocol. But I'll give you even more, uh, uh, I have an animation basically that describes the, uh, the process. So what is metadata? What can you do? Well, it shouldn't surprise you because it's really the sort of things that you do on your laptop, right? When you use the command line, uh, that's what all of us do every day. You can create a directory, delete a directory, you can write a file, append to a file, read a file, delete a file. So all of these um, uh, options are metadata. Okay, so let's look at my animation now. So we've, uh, we have a client right here. That's whoever is connecting to the AGFS cluster. That could be your laptop. That could also be a machine in the cluster. We come back to that. We have the name node right here and we have data nodes right there. So what happens is that first, uh, we want to read a file, right? This is what I'm describing now. So the client connects to the name node and asks for a specific file in order to, uh, to read it. The name node, you remember what there is on the name node. There is the file namespace, there is the mapping from the files to the blocks, the block identifiers, and there's the mapping to the block from the block identifiers to the locations in the, on the data, right? So the name node has all it needs to give back to the, to the clients all the block locations of the file, so the blocks that the file is made of, the block locations, uh, so it can provide multiple data nodes for each block because as we saw, there's replicas. Each node is replicated multiple times, so each block is on several data nodes. So it's providing for every block identifier for that file, multiple data nodes, and it sorts them by distance. This is also something I'm gonna come back to. Uh, so it's basically uh, putting first the closest data nodes to the, to the clients to, to optimize things. And the, the client can just go down the lists and just use the first data nodes that it finds that can provide the block, right? I'll come back of what we mean on what we mean by distance shortly. Next, what happens is that the client knows where to go to ask for the blocks, right? That's, that's the question you asked yesterday. So what it does is that it connects to uh, each block in turn and, uh, and uh, tries the first from the list for every block 
downloads the block, then goes to the next data node, downloads the block, goes to the next data node, downloads the block, and so on. So why did I draw this in the middle of the screen? I drew this in the middle of the screen because going from data node to data node and requesting the blocks is something that is actually nicely encapsulated and hidden in the Java library of HDFS. It means that if you are reading HDFS from Java, you will, as an end user, not need to manually go from data node to data node because you have this HDFS input stream right there that does it for you. It will automatically take care of switching between the data nodes to get every time you change the block. But for the client, from the client perspective, from the Java API, it will just receive an, a very long sequence of bytes uh, uh, that, that goes all the way until the end of the file. And again, switching between blocks is uh, hidden behind that input stream. But on the network, of course, you see all that, that protocol that is block by block. This is really something happened on the client machine in the Java library that is taken care of. Right? So this is, of course, a sequential read. What I'm describing here is a sequential read. Right? Um, we will see later when we use MapReduce and Spark that we will actually access the blocks in parallel. Right? That's the whole point of it. Right? But for now, let's just focus on sequential. So this is for reading a file. If you write a file, that's slightly more complicated because the file doesn't exist yet. Right? So you also need to know where to write the blocks to and so on. All right, so who do we communicate first with? Of course, the name node. Right, as always. So we create the file. So we ask uh, the, the name node, please, can I create that file? And here's the path of the file. You need to create the, the, the directories to that, to that file. And uh, the um, name node says, OK, yes, that's fine. You can create that file. It doesn't exist yet, and so on. So you can now write your first block, first 128 megabytes. And here are the three data nodes. Can be three. Of course, it's configurable to which you should send, send your blocks. So now the client has three data nodes that it should send the blocks to. What the client does is that it connects to the first of these data nodes and asks that data node to organize a pipeline with the other data nodes. So of course, it sends over also the coordinates of the other data nodes so that this one knows which ones to contact. And then a pipeline is organized, right? So you set up here the network connections in such a way that you can then send the block. And then the block is sent over the network. This is done in a streaming fashion. It's a little bit of Netflix, right? So uh, it means that you don't ship just once the 128 megabytes, right? It's more like in, in kilobyte size packets. So you keep sending little packets, little packets, and it's streaming over the network. And the acknowledgments are asynchronous. So you might already have sent 20, 10 or 20 packets. And then you start receiving the acknowledgement for the first packet, right? So, so it's just all the way, sends the data over. Then the acts come again asynchronously for all the little packets, right? And once you have the final act, so all the packets for the block have been accepted, then you can request the data nodes for the second block and again, ship over in little packets. I repeat, do not confuse these network packets with the blocks. It's not the same thing. The block is for HDFS, 128 megabytes. The packets are something on the network layer. It's a network protocol that allows you to just stream over the way you ship the data over the network, right? So the packets are smaller than the block, right? Then you send the data over. Asynchronously, you get the acts. When you have all acts, you, 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 you request the next block, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. You just iterate, 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 iterate until you have sent all of your blocks. And once you are done, you can say, you can inform the name, okay, now I'm done. I have written all the blocks I wanted to written. So the file is now complete. Uh, please close uh, that file now and release the lock because of course, for the entire duration in, under which you are writing this file, nobody else can access it. It's all locked, blocked. Uh, so, so nobody can read it yet. So this is why you need to also release the lock right there. And once this is done, the name node still waits a bit uh, because you might remember that the name node must have a confirmation that the blocks were received. It doesn't trust blindly the, the, the client, right? So the name node is now going to wait for the heartbeats of these, uh, of these, um, uh, of these data nodes right there. And the heartbeats will contain the information on the newly received blocks. So the, 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 they will tell the name node, okay, I have received this and that and this and that block, right? So now 
the, the name node waits for what is called minimal replication. Maybe it doesn't need to be three. Maybe you can wait for two right now. It's en enough to have two. And once you have this minimal replication, then you can acknowledge to the client and say, okay, that's fine. Your file is written. The lock is released. Everybody can read, right? So you have this minimal replication. This is called synchronous. Synchronous means the client is waiting for the name nodes to confirm that it's on. This is synchronous. So minimal replication is synchronous. And later, and this is now asynchronous, we replicate further in order to go all the way up to the required uh, uh, long-term number of replicas, which is three by default, right? So again, you have this notion of minimal replication for which is synchronous. And once you're done, you continue replicating until you reach the desired level, but asynchronous. So it's a nice compromise between waiting and continuing to replicate uh, behind the scenes, right? And of course, this, this replication will continue to happen whenever an, a data node fails and a block is lost, a block is lost, and so on and so on. The, the name node will make sure to trigger the replications. It makes sure at all times that you have these three replicas. And if it sees that there is what we call an under-replicated block, it makes sure to ask the data nodes to ship it over uh, in order to replicate it enough times. All right, so I hope um, it makes sense uh, to you. So that should answer now a question that I remember one of you asked yesterday. Uh, if the client directly communicates with the data nodes, uh, can it not uh, fool? Uh, uh, is there not an issue with the, with, the, um, with the protocol, right? But in fact, in some cases, you can directly communicate with the data nodes. And we'll actually see that in the case of MapReduce, it's called short circuiting, but I, I'll, come, I'll come back later. What's very important is that this here is not a blockchain. This is not the Bitcoin or the Ethereum network where you have people from over, all over the world who join and you cannot trust everybody. This here is happening in the data center. You have full control over all these nodes. You have uh, an, an access. You, you, you need to, to, to access HDFS with credentials. You know, So, so th th there are a few guarantees to be able to access the network. But once you are within, the cluster, and of course, then you, you, you should expect that the machines follow the protocol, right? So this is, uh, this is of course a requirement. So again, from a security perspective, it is the job of the, whoever is the sysadmin of the cluster to make sure that, uh, that, that to, 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 to allow access to only the people that should access the cluster and, and, and to have full control and that nobody from outside can mess with, uh, with uh, uh, what is in there, right? So, so now let me say a few words about the replicas. So I said the default is three, right? So every time you have a, a, a new block, the, the, the goal is to have it replicated three times. But now where should we put the blocks is the next question. So what should we consider for putting the blocks? Well, there, there are several things actually that should be considered. There's the reliability uh, of the network. There's the read-write bandwidth. So the speed at which you gets the data and write the data on the network and the distribution of the blocks, right? So if you concentrate them too much and there is a, a, a crash in a rack or in a node, then you might lose them, right? So for example, it's probably a bad idea to put two replicas of the same block in the same node, right? Because if that node crashes, then you lose two. Right? So that's already a first thing. So they should be on separate nodes. But in order to account for that, we need the notion of a distance. So we need to know something on the topology of the network. Until now, I didn't say anything about that. I just said there's data nodes and that's it, right? But the data nodes, as you might remember, as I told you, they are organized in a cluster. They are, they are basically made of these servers that are piled on top of each other into racks. So this is a pile of server, right? There's maybe 10 servers in there, maybe 15. This is a rack. And here, these are the nodes that they are in this rack. Node is the same as server, right? For the purpose of this discussion. It's all the, the data nodes. And here we have another rack with, again, plenty of data nodes, right? And so we have plenty of racks. Then we have the, the cluster. And if you want, uh, in, in some protocols, you can even have different clusters and different data centers, right? So you, you, you can even geographically add more levels to that tree. But I think it's enough for the purpose of explaining the placements to work just with these levels, right? So there's nodes and they are in racks. They can be in the same rack or in different racks. So now we can talk about the notion of distance this node and this node are very close to each other, right? They, they are in the same rack right here, right? So 
we can say the distance is two. It's basically the number of edges that you need to cross in either direction to go from one to the other. So one, two, so the distance is two. Now, between this and this note, they are in different tracks. So now you go here, one, two, three, and four. So you see that we have this additional um, transport here, which is basically on network switches between the racks now. So this takes more time. You might have less bandwidth because of course, on this network uh, cable, all of the nodes there are shipping data, right? So this is why the distance is more important. Uh, uh, and of course, this is going to be slower. Uh, if you try from this node to read data that is on that node to get blocks from here to here, uh, then it's going to be slower, right? Okay, so how do we place the replicas? So let me tell you the default thing that's going to happen when, when you place replicas. The first replica is placed on the same node as the client, if the client is a data node or random or otherwise, just pick any node in some rack that we call A. The second replica is placed on a node in an other Okay, someplace else. So this is just in case one of the racks fails, the entire tower uh, crashes, then uh, uh, we, we have the, no, the, 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 the replica in a different rack, another replica. And replica three is a node in the same rack B, right? So A, B, and again B, but a different node. And replica four and beyond, we just start doing it randomly, but if possible, no more than one replica per node, per node that I already told you, because if the node crashes, you lose both at most two replicas per rack, all right? So this is the idea, right? So if you have the client right there, this is the client, there is one replica on the same machine as the client, and there is a second replica in this other rack, different rack, and the third one is this in the same other rack, but on a different, this is the default. Right? Uh, and you see, if we have now another block, you will see that the two blocks, the, two, the first replicas here will all be stored on the client. There's enough room. Then we'll have one rack with the two replicas of this block and another rack with the two replicas of this block, right? Now you could ask, there, there's actually two questions that I can see you asking. The first question is why replica two and three on another rack, why do we not put the first two replicas on the same rack right there? Well, this is what would happen if instead we said, okay, Let's put the first two replicas in that rack and then take another rack for the third replica. But then we have, you see a block concentration. Imagine what happens if that, if that rack fails. We lost two replicas of every block. This was all concentrated here. Now we, have, we, are, we are in the very risky situation that there is only one replica and one replica for the blocks. So this is very dangerous. So this is why in terms of durability, this is why we prefer to have them on a different right, right there, right? The other question that is typically asked at that point is, how does it make any sense that the client is one of the data nodes, right? Because you might say, okay, the client is your laptop. It's the laptop that you use in order to connect to the cluster, right? So how does it make any sense that you can put uh, the, 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 the first replica on the same node as the client? Well, it could be, of course, that it's your laptop. Uh, that you are using as the client. But then in that case, of course, you cannot put the replica here. Then you put a random uh, node in the server. But we'll see in the future that in many cases, the client is actually one of the data nodes. And the reason is simply because on these nodes, there's not only HDFS running. There's also MapReduce, there's also HBase, there's also Spark. So there's plenty of other processes and other pieces of software that need to access HDFS. And because these need to access HDFS, it means that each one of these nodes, when you use MapReduce or Spark of HBase, is a client, right? Each one is a potential client of HDFS. So when you have MapReduce or Spark or whoever writes uh, to, to, to HDFS, then of course, this might be the, the where MapReduce or who, whichever process is writing to HDFS, and then you'll put the replica on that same machine. So this is why it makes sense to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to um, uh, say that the client is the same as one of the main nodes, data nodes, right? Do we have a question, I think, on the Zoom chat? Um, well, 
So Adrian asks, why not put one on the same rack as client, uh, two on rack B and three on rack C to distribute the replicas as much as possible between racks? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question too. You could also do that. Then you, it seems like you have even more um, distribution of the blocks. I think it's uh, for the case that you might have nodes um, from another process, another technology, reading data from the same file and in that case, you, you do want to have some of the replicas uh, stored in the same cluster. In case one of them is unavailable or one of them fails, then you can still access it uh, uh, without having to go all over. So here, it really has to do with the speed. You, 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 you want to keep some, some efficiency uh, in the access. So it's a compromise, really. It's a compromise uh, between spreading them as much as possible, but on the other hand, you also want to keep them a bit close to each other uh, in order to, to have efficient reads, right? That's think, for example, of the pipelining. Imagine the pipelining. The pipelining goes from here to here to here. So you see the pipeline is more efficient if between blocks two and three, it, it goes like that. It basically will uh, less, uh, uh, um, th there will be less of a bottleneck on the inter-rack communication, if you want. And um, these sort of things is also, we'll go to the other question after that. The, the, this sort of thing is heavily researched by the network community. And there are also professors here at ETH that study how in networks you can route all of these packets uh, efficiently, right? It's just out of scope. Do we have uh, another question? Uh, so there was a second part of the question. Why do we require two racks by default? And actually another student, uh, Jun Ling, asked to clarify the question itself, I think. Uh, like the previous question, I mean, like uh, that Adrian asked, like uh, maybe it so the question sure. or my answer. I, I didn't uh, clarify my answer. Or the question. I mean, Jungling asking, like, what was the question? Like the previous one about uh, this this fact that we have two on the same rack and then one on the other, other rack. I guess they just wanted more more clarification. Uh, I see. Maybe what I understand was meant is why do we not put one replica here, the second here, and the third one on another. So basically pick a different track every time. That yeah. was the question, the first question. Yeah. And, and Adrian's second question was, why do we require two racks, not more? Yeah. That... Uh, it's a bit uh, related uh, to, to, to what I just said, right? That if you decide to have just three replicas, then of course that gives you two racks. But you can also configure HDFS to have more replicas. You can put four or five or six replicas, right? And in that case, of course, uh, you will have more racks if you have more replicas. So this is absolutely something that you can control. Uh, so Roberto is asking, uh, how do we ensure that two blocks don't place the replicas in the same rack? Um, and do we leave it to chance or do we actually ensure it? Uh, so here I'm not sure I understand because we do want to have them in the same, uh, in the same rack. Uh, uh, right here, right? It, it, it's on purpose. But then if we avoid, how do we avoid then uh, uh, having too many on the same rack? All of that, remember, is decided by uh, the name node. You see, it's the name node that tells what the data nodes are. This is all done by the name node. So the name node can decide that it's completely centralized. Uh, picking the picking the data block. So it's going to look for free space, which data blocks have free space and how are they topologically organized. But all of that is decided right here. This is the brain. I think that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, no more questions? Uh, we... So Benjamin asked, uh, any examples of a use case for DFS? Um, or um, and is it general purpose to assist distributed computing? I, I guess, so, yeah, it's a general question, yeah. Yeah, it's a general question. The use cases will come. Uh, one use case is, of course, that you want to store large amounts of data. But of course, right now we are talking about storage, but why are we storing that data? We are storing that data because we want to query it, right? And of course, this is what we do in the, in the coming weeks, right? We look into MapReduce, into Spark, into all of these technologies. These are the use cases. The use cases is we store the data there in such a way first that we don't lose it. And second, uh, that we can efficiently query it in parallel and with batch processing. Right. So the use cases are MapReduce, Spark, HBase, everything that we see in the coming weeks. 
All right, it's our fundamental storage layer. Um, so there's a, another question, Yushang, uh, I think, will uh, ask, will replicating blocks break the sequential access or all data nodes will take care of, uh, uh, will take care of it? So the replication basically does it uh, break the sequential access? Uh, I don't think it breaks it because when you access sequentially, you only request one replica of the block. Mm. So if, for example, if you want to access the data uh, right now, um, and imagine you are here, then it's very likely you're only going to ask from one of these two, but only one of these two, for example, this one. And you don't even bother to talk with the others, right? So, so you just talk with the closest one. Because again, when you receive as the client, the list of the data nodes that host a replica of your block, it's sorted by distance. So these two will be first in the list from the perspective of that node, and this one will be last. All right. So it doesn't affect the sequentially because you only read one replica. But if you don't have it, it's unavailable, then you go to the next data node. All right. Um, so there's a few more questions. Uh, uh, one, da, I think. Uh, so in uh, asking in the client replica sense, the replica is not fully symmetric. Um, is that the case? Uh, yes, you could not see sure. that way. Yeah, yeah, you could see that way. There, there's kind of an asymmetry here, of course. Um, and Boli is asking, in a case of replicas further uh, asynchronously, it seems this connection is initiated by name node, but no connection between name node and data node should be initiated by name node. The name node is not initiating any connection. It did. The name node only it designates volunteers, if you want. The name node just say, OK, this data node, this data node, this data node will receive the data. But it informs the, 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 the client of that. And it's the client that's then going to connect to the data nodes to ship the data. The, the name node doesn't do anything in this respect. It, it basically. It, it, it's, it's the client's problem to, uh, to communicate with the data nodes, all right? And there's uh, one more. Uh, so Grigory, I think, uh, is asking, could the blocks be corrupted? And if so, uh, does the system uh, check for it? Uh, yeah. Like validate the blocks, basically? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. Yes, the replicas can be corrupted, and you have to prepare for that. You can have a hard drive that has issues on the magnetic you know, level and so on. Yes. You have for that hash codes of the of the blocks. You can you can have checksums uh, like MD5 and so on. And this is checked. And if you see that the checksum isn't correct, then you know it's corrupted. And then you can uh, discard that block and uh, replicate it again with the other ones. Of course, you might ask, okay, what happens if um, imagine you have just two replicas and they don't have the same checksum? How do you know uh, that there is an issue? Well. That's the point. You, you don't really know which one is the right one. So a, a possibility is to store a checksum right there. But this is also a motivation for having three replicas. Because if you have one of them corrupted, you still see the other two that are the same. And the, 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 the likeliness that two of them would be corrupted is already much uh, lower. right? So uh, the, the idea is that the majority wins. right? If you have too much in replicas, then uh, they, they, they win over the corrupted ones. It's part of durability, right? We want to be prepared for fault tolerance. That's a good question. So indeed, sometimes you have a complete crash and it's not, but sometimes you just have a corruption. Uh, there are no further questions. All right, perfect. So let me then move on to the other question you had yesterday, which is what happened if the what happens if the name load fails? So here's it. Here it is. It's a single point of failure. What if it fails? Well, if it fails, we lose, we lose all of that, right? So this is, this is lost, all of that that we had here. And of course, we can no longer access uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the data. So what we want to persist is this, this, and this. But then you might ask yourself, do we really need to persist this? Because this is just telling you which block identifiers are on which data nodes. But if you think about it, this is something you can recover. All you need to do is wait for the block reports of the data nodes because they, they are still here, the data nodes. So this is something you can reconstruct, right? So this is why only these two, the namespace and the mapping from files to blocks, is persisted somewhere. So this was in memory, 
until now, we persisted to some persistent storage. It can be a network drive, as simple as that. So of course not HDFS, uh, but a network attached storage drive, for example. We have plenty of that also in, in the data centers that you can build also with, uh, for example, with Amazon services. So all of that is to be stored in a namespace file. And if, so it's persisted at one point of time, and if we modify the system, because of course clients will connect and add files and create directories and so on, what we do is we just append as a log. We say, okay, we did that change, that change, that change, that change, that change. We just append that as a log. And of course that grows over time. So now you can also for extra security, persist that to S3 object storage is called Glacier on tapes and so on, uh, as many times as you want if you're paranoid. So all of that should be backed up to be absolutely sure, but it will take a few hours to recover. Of course. So now what happens if it fails? We need to start it up again. We need to, to, to maybe reboot it. And what happens if we reboot it is that we can load from the namespace file, uh, the, 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 the file system and the, and the mapping to the blocks and so on. But then we have to go through the edit log and play it. We, we have to apply all of these changes one by one. This takes time. It, it's like a recording, right? So we play that recording in order, so this is a snapshot, and then we play that recording in order to have the most recent changes, right? So the block locations, all you need to do is wait for the data nodes to ship their reports, right? You can also request them and then you can recreate that. But the thing is, it takes 30 minutes. That's completely unacceptable. You, you cannot ask people if there's a crash to wait for 30 minutes. That, that's just too much time. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, do that. So can we do better? The answer is yes, of course we can do better. One way is that we can periodically compute a new snapshot. We can periodically merge back the edit log into the, the, the snapshot there and have a newer snapshot. So that might be yesterday and now this is today, right? So the edit log that way rem remains small enough. You don't let the edit log grow too big. For example, imagine the size it would have after one year, right? Uh, another way that we, uh, that we deal with this, um, just one moment. Uh, there was a question from before, like, um, should I? Uh, so one question yep. is basically for uh, replicas, uh, so, sorry, for checking the, the corruption. Is it uh, required that we ask for two replicas? No, uh, no, it's the, it's the job of the name node to check these things. It's not the client. Yeah, yeah. I see. In some cases, I don't know if HGFS have it, you could also store checksums on the name node and then ask the client to check the checksum, right? But the name node actively checks for corruption. That, that's the, its responsibility, all right? So okay. coming back to the issue of, of crashing, well, we need a president and a vice president. That's basically what is happening right here. So we have another uh, node that's called the standby data node. It basically takes care of the checks points and so on that I said earlier but it also has exactly the same state, right? It maintains the same state. Everything that's done here is also done there, but just in the shadow. And what happens if this node crashes is this one can almost instantly join because it's already ready to, uh, to, 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 uh, to jump in. It's its only job is to be in the shadow, mirroring what happens there, ready to jump in. You will see in literature backup name nodes, uh, 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 checkpoint name nodes, secondary name nodes, and so on and so on. These are all previous versions of that. There, there were every year they came up with a new better version of how to have high availability. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the latest, but maybe it will continue to evolve. So don't be confused if you see other kinds of name nodes. These are just earlier versions of that that were less capable than this one. Another thing we can do is federated DFS. And anybody of you who installed Linux on your machine might know that, that you can allocate parts of the file system on different partitions on your drive. You can do the same in HDFS. You can say slash foo is handled by this name node, slash bar is handled by this name node, and that way you can have, it's like Switzerland, it's a confederation of, and the contents are the, are, the, are the name nodes right there, right? So you can have a federated file system as well. Okay, so now comes the cool part. How do we use it? Well, the good news is it's very similarly to your command line. You have this HadoopFS utility that you provide arguments to. I will show you the arguments. Uh, and you can also directly specifically go to HDFS, uh, the, the, this other utility, they do the same thing. But the difference is that this one also supports the local file system, S3, anything else. So this is why this is the recommendation to use this one and not directly HDFS. It's just for your convenience, right? So this is the way to go. 
And how does it look like when well, this is be going to be familiar? Recognize LS to list the files, CAT to see the content of a file, RM to delete a file, MK here just with an additional dash. So it's very similar to the POSIX standard, right? Of what you can do to a file system. You just need to prefix it with Hadoop FS, and then there you go. And slash is the root of the, of the, of the file cluster and so on, right? The only thing you will notice is that it's slower than your local file system. But apart from that, it really feels the same. It's the same look and feel, right? So this is uh, a way also to copy over. So you have copy from local. This is to upload a file from your laptop all the way to the cluster. You can do that. Uh, and you can download files by saying, download that file from HDFS to your laptop. Of course, it will not work with a petabyte file, right? It's going to work if the file is, fits on your laptop. All right. Next, I wanted to show you the configuration. Uh, this is how you specify which cluster to use uh, for HDFS. So there's some address here, HDFS, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and um, this says that your default file system is, um, is HDFS. So you, you see, th this is almost boring, right? It's just configuration and things that you can change. You can change the replication factor, very dangerous here. It's just one, it should be three or four or higher. So you can set it all up somewhere in an XML file that is actually on all machines. Typically, you don't have to do that. There's a configuration interface and you can just go via the configuration interface, right? But just so you know, there's XML in there, right? So how you can use AGFS is also with automated tools. You can automatically collect logs into AGFS. Plume does exactly that. It automatically uh, uh, dumps your logs to AGFS. You can also take a relational database and automatically import with scoop your data into HDFS uh, as files. And then you can query it uh, from HDFS. All right? So we're almost there. Just a few words on GFS, which is the original kind of invented by Google. You just need to be aware if you decide to look at the paper, but you don't have to look at the GFS paper. It's on the GFS that you have to read. But for some of you who really wanted to see the GFS paper, what you will notice is just that the words change. They don't say name node, they say master. They don't say data node, they say chunk server. They don't say block, they say chunk. They don't say uh, uh, image files, uh, files, files is same image. They say checkpoint image. They don't say edit log, they say operation log and so on and so on and so on. So, this shouldn't bother you, right? These are just words. Uh, so so uh, just be open to the fact that the words might vary, but the architecture is more or less uh, the same, all right? And of course, there's a small difference in the exact block size, but what matters here is really the order of magnitude, right? This is really the same order of magnitude. Uh, Cloudera is one of the uh, vendors of AGFS. They, they provide a package version of AGFS that, that you can install. There's a few of them. Uh, they use this block size. Uh, GFS and uh, the Apache version use 64. So yeah, it, it really depends what you what you use. All right. So there's an official documentation that you can look at. Uh, uh, there's uh, the GFS paper. Uh, if you want, it's optional, but the AGFS paper is the mandatory one, the original one. You can also look at the Java API if you're interested, but this is really optional. It's just if you want to get an impression uh, of, uh, of uh, how the, uh, the source code looks like, right? So with this, uh, we complete uh, today's lecture and AGFS. You'll have exercises next week uh, to work on this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, send them over uh, on the Moodle forum. We are here to help. Uh, I hope you will enjoy your exercise session uh, on uh, cloud storage tomorrow and, uh, and on Friday. And uh, yeah, we are, uh, we are going to be here for you if you need, uh, if you need anything. So just before you go, please just take the time uh, to answer this quick uh, poll right here. That, oh, oh yeah. there you go. To so just check that you're, that you're following. I like to do this from time to time. And that way I can accelerate and I, I can slow down. Yeah. And then we'll be good to go. Where is it? Like I'm trying to go there. Like. Yeah. Or it might not be projecting in the room, but uh, I, I think uh, you can see it on your application and it's all recorded. Uh, so it will be in the YouTube uh, in the YouTube recording. Do you have it, Amir? Yeah. Okay, very good. So this is exactly what I want to be. My goal is to have as many as possible between 80 and 
uh, everything is wonderful. Uh, and uh, below that is also good too. If you're less than half, don't be worried. Just write us, uh, read the papers and uh, see that other angle and write to us if anything isn't clear. And whenever I see that there's too many people who understand everything, I can accelerate a bit. If I see that there's too many people who understand uh, less than 80 or less than half, then I can slow down a bit, all right? So, all right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. And uh, I wish you a good rest of the day and I'll see you next week. Uh, where we we'll talk about syntax, the syntax of the files that we will store uh, on top of uh, HGFS. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you.